Good morning, my people. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depending on your location, we are coming to you today. It's Friday from my end. And I say happy weekend to you all. I pray that God will make a very good conclusion for you during the week. Yes, give you conclusion, answer to prayers, expectation not be short, uh, cut short in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the news is this. There's this message from Mazinam Dekano. You know, they say it's leaked audio. Why we must not allow Biafra to slip off our hand. The work of sabotage is not for us, it's against us. It doesn't matter who is doing it. Because that work is the work of the devil against Biafra liberation. It doesn't matter if it is pastor that is doing it or brother Unam the Kano's brother or wife or lawyer or whoever. No, it doesn't matter. What matters is that that sabotage you are doing is against liberation, is against freedom, is against light, and is against the good of our people. So the advice is that you drop it. Now you have to please listen again. To the voice of our Hamadike Biafra, leaked audio according to what I heard. All right, please let's follow him to the end. I'll be right back. We wouldn't exist tomorrow morning. Anybody who answers or addresses him or herself as a Nigerian is a product of neocolonialism, not something that I am prepared to accept because Nigeria never existed until Flora Shaw gave her that name, Nigeria. Before that, you had to do the work. Before that, you had Biafra. Before that, you had Kremlin Bruno Empire and all these wonderful and weird civilizations. Now, a white man cannot come from Europe and then create an identity for me. Only God in heaven can do that. And I can give an identity to my dog. The only thing you can name are your children and your pets. They are not our fathers. They are Caucasians. We are black Africans. They have no right being in Africa and giving us names. And that I will never ever accept. Military and security experts have said it is impossible for any country to fight two civil wars without monumental repercussions. Have you considered this? And what lessons did you learn from the last Nigerian civil war? The lessons that we learned from the last war, if I can beginning by addressing your last question is that we should not have given up. Even though we were overawed as a result of a global conspiracy of unprecedented proportions, Biafra-Nigeria war was the third world war. Because in that war, if you leave Nigeria and Biafra alone, Biafra would defeat Nigeria any time, any day. Pound for pound, Biafra would defeat Nigeria any time, any day, and I make bold to say this. But Britain got involved. They imposed a no-fly zone over Biafra land. They imposed air, land, and sea blockade to stop us from getting food and arms. But they went behind the back of the world to negotiate with Russia to supply arms to go on. They even brought in Egyptian pilots to fly their planes for them. Nigeria has never won any war in its history. Ordinary Boko Haram, they are begging Niger, they are begging Chad, they are begging Cameroon to help them. They have never won any war. The only thing they specialize in doing is killing civilians, as they did at Lake Itogate. That's what they can do. Nigeria has never fought any war. They've, they, an army is meant to go out to win territories for the country that it claims is coming from. The same way that Lugard led an expeditionary force to come to create Nigeria for the crown in Britain. Nigerian soldiers have not done that before. Anywhere they go, they're humiliated and they come back. So I wouldn't actually see, um, I wouldn't describe what transpired between 67 and 70 as a Biafra Nigeria war. Is Biafra versus the whole world. The United States was ambivalent. They never actually, um, um, should I say, participated as they should. Britain was there running the whole show. They, they destroyed Aburi, Aburi Accord destroyed the agreement reached between Ujuku and Gowan. They came back and they instigated a war. That was all they did. There, there was not, I wouldn't see it as a war. And I want to let Nigeria understand this. There is that tendency that what I call the Fulani Jangjawudism, there is that tendency 
to, to intimidate, that tendency to terrorize, that tendency to subdue, overrun, and then conquer people. It is not going to happen in our time. They will try, but they will fail. The more they focus their attention in the East, the more the terrorists that they have they themselves spread in the North will overrun them there. So I am not in any way, shape, or form either phased or overawed. They will come again because it's in their nature, and this time around, they'll be roundly defeated. Well, I think we do respect to our men and women of armed forces. I believe they are well rated. Uh, I visited them in Liberia. I visited them in Sierra Leone. In Liberia, we were controlling 10 out of 15 counties. In Sierra Leone, in fact, we actually lost one of our brigadiers. And the Sierra Leoneans are eternally grateful to us because but for the support from Nigeria, both countries, I don't know what would have happened to them. In fact, at the time, Professor Adeniji was the head of UNAMSI in Sierra Leone. Uh, I think it would be unfair uh, to describe as military as weak. It is possible, yes, that they got support from somewhere else. Of course, there are allies. That's why you add NATO. Uh, in fact, it's one of the reasons a lot of people are angry with America under Trump that he has virtually collapsed the relationship, military ties to other countries. So I'll leave it at that. But then I want to go to the next question. The Igbos are obviously marginalized in the political configuration of Nigeria, but they have done extremely well globally in business, in sciences, in commerce, and so on. Won't they, are, won't they risk a lot of these spectacular achievements if you decide to go the way you want to go? Um, I should have thought that your question, or should I say succeeded, in introducing the tribal and ethnic dimension into what we are doing. Those of us in the South, those I am proud of the, of the should I say, the understanding that those of us in the East have with our Yoruba brothers in the West, and of course, as time goes on, also Middle Belt. There, have, there is now a recognition that we are our own worst enemies. In Katsina states, there are other tribes other than Hausa and Fulani. In Katsina, in Bauchi, the same thing. All across the North, it is not a homogeneous society. The only thing that binds them together is just their language. Underneath, if you scratch the surface, you will begin to see a lot of, they have more ethnic groups in the North than you have in the South. More, many more in the North than have in the South. But over the years, the Fulani oligarchy have managed to, to should I say, um, 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 uh, moderate their differences. And despite what is going on, Underneath, they have always succeeded in presenting this united front for the North. Anytime we try that in the South, they bring in their, what are, people are referred to as professional gossipers. They bring in people who will always do their best to divide us because the North understands. Any day the Igbo and the Yoruba put their differences behind them, get their acts together, for goodness sake, Nigeria will be a better place. Everybody knows that very well. So in order not to allow that to happen, they, and they now appoint, or should I say, rig our governors into office. They go to Ohanese, they bribe a few people, they go to a funny fellow, they identify one or two people to, should I say, to groom, to do their dirty jobs for them. And what is that dirty job? You saw it in full view and in full display on the 20th. People that claim they went to school, People that claim they are senior advocates, people that claim they are enlightened, were the ones that introduced the tribal and ethnic dimension into that very successful protest. And you can see where we are today. They are rejoicing in the North. They are having fun in the North. That thing they have always done, once again, they have done it. And, but of course, they cannot break us. This time around, we will just want to let them understand this. The unity between the Igbos and the Yorubas is deeper than NSAS protest. It is far more fundamental than they can even imagine. 
Now, is Biafra your only option? Or you are willing to work with other so-called oppressed peoples to form a union like it is in the United Arab Emirates? Everything depends on what the people want. I am a Democrat. I am a Republican by genetic disposition. Anything the people want is what they're going to get. My dream and my mission is Biafra. Let's say during a referendum, people decide we want to be, yes, Biafra is good. We can answer Biafra within a union that comprises of Middle Belt, of Udutua, and Biafra with a new name. Who am I to say, no, I'm a Democrat. Whatever the majority decides is what I'm going to do. But as for us, we are pursuing Biafra. And I will also help the Dudua people to pursue the Dua Republic. I will help the Middle Belt to do the same. But one thing is paramount. Should our people decide at a referendum or place beside to say, we want to maintain a semblance of union with the Dudua and the Middle Belt, who am I to say no? I am a Democrat and I will go with it. But my primary concern now is the restoration of Biafra. An audio surfaced recently, I think about two weeks ago, it was sent to me by a family member in which your voice, we had your voice, audio, directing your objectives to hit certain targets in Lagos. What led to this in a state that has really embraced the people of Southeast and South South extractions? Uh, do you if that was your voice, do you regret the action and are you willing to apologize for it? It is my voice, but what I said was caught and joined together to suit the very message or narrative that our detractors were, should I say, determined to peddle. If you listen to the whole broadcast that I made, you will find out that that very audio that those people, those charlatans put out there in the public domain is not exactly what I intended. But I have said this before and allow me to repeat. If by making the pronouncement that I made on that very day that I was misunderstood or that the true intentions of what I was wishing or willing to convey was somehow misconstrued, then I apologize for it. Because I believe that it is very, very important that we understand this. I wouldn't want to do anything, either knowingly or unknowingly, to inflame passions in the West. I wouldn't wish to do anything that will cause my Yoruba brothers and sisters alike to think, should I say, to become jittery about what our two intentions are. You made reference to your operatives. I was addressing Nigerian youths right across Nigeria, not just in Lagos. And given the heat of the moment, people were being massacred. I'm not sure that most of those commentators and apologies for Asarok have had their homes invaded before. When Fela speaks, you can hear the way that Fela speaks all the time about Nigeria army and Nigeria police. Why? Because Fela was a witness when his house was invaded and the mother died as a result of it. The same thing happened to me. As a result of Nigerian military invasion of my house, my father is dead and my mother is dead as well. So when people like us with a first-hand experience of the brutality of a very primitive security architecture in a country as backward as Nigeria, you can then begin to appreciate where we're coming from. If I spoke out of turn, if people who listened to what I said misunderstood the true intentions behind the words that I uttered that night, then I do unreservedly apologize because nobody can divide the Yorubas and the Igbos anymore. It's not going to happen. They will try, but they will not succeed. That I can assure them. What is of concern to us is that those responsible for the slaughter of those people are held responsible. The same way I hasten to add that those who are responsible for the murder that we can order today going on in Obi will be held accountable. They will and must be held accountable. I do apologize if I've offended anyone. 
but no offense was intended in the first place. I gave an order to Nigerian youth right across the board to do what they did because the Nigerian state is evil. They believe in killing their own children. They believe in suppressing free speech. They believe in breaking up, breaking up peaceful assembly with the use of force. That type of nonsense must come to an end. And they must be taught a lesson. And that was exactly what we did. OK, let me confess that it was actually that audio that led me to looking for you. You see, I believe that journalists must help their nation uh, to understand some certain people and personalities like yourself. Uh, and I want to say at this stage that I'm sending my special thanks to two people. One of them I can mention publicly, the other doesn't who would not want me to mention him. And the first is Femi Panika Day, my very dear friend and brother. I contacted him because I knew there is a special bond between the two of you. And uh, he contacted someone else who contacted you. And I want to say thank you to both of them so they know themselves. What is the relationship between you and Femi that Every time I see that uh, you are in the same direction. He is very brave. He is urbane. He is polished and very erudite. He is a scholar and a conscientious one at that. You know, in Nigeria, you have scholars, people who just study for the sake of it, people who just read for the sake of it. He practicalizes what he understands to be humanity. And that is why I love him, I respect him, and I call him a brother. He, he epitomizes what any intellectual should aspire to be. You intellectualize that is very true or very good, and then you must have a human side to yourself. He is de-tribalized, as you well know, and I'm sure that in time to come, he will have a very great role to play, if not in Udu Dua, but also in Bia. If Biafra were to come tomorrow, I would take him. And I'm sure that he will have a lot to contribute in making Biafra a better place for everybody to be in. So I have not only love for him, but also have regard for him. Now, I'm sure you are aware. I honestly. There are efforts to start a movement. I honestly do not think Mazin Namdekano would still hold the same opinion of that stomach infrastructure bingo called uh, Femi Fani Kayode. Mazin Namdekano would wish he takes this word back about that idiot called Femi Fani Kayode. MNK, we know you trust people. We know you believed that man was a sincere person. But honestly, that man is worse than the people we are fighting to stop encroaching into our land. Ah, the sleep one day my eye don't come out because of the accolades my leader is giving to that idiot. Hey, you were well um. Mazin Nam Don't worry. We know who you are. You are an honest man. Femi Fanika Yode, Chineke Gapogoku. Bogoku Pomila Pomila. That will bring uh, the Yorubas and the Igbos together and closer. Are you willing to play a major role in that union? Yes, we are doing ours on the ground. You saw the protest on the 1st of October right across the world, Yoruba One Voice and IPOB. So we are doing ours. That was why I categorically stated. And without any equivocation, that the bond between the Yorubas and the Igbos can no longer be broken by anybody. They will try, but they will fail. It can't be broken anymore. So I am more than willing and able to serve in whatever capacity is required of me to make sure that these two great nations pilot the affairs of black people in Africa going forward. Because without them, Africa is doomed, more or less. Now, I will plead with you 
to take the next question very softly uh, because as a Christian, I believe my faith teaches me to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So which means I respect constituted authority. My question yes. is about your best friend, our president and commander. Now, you propounded this theory of a cloned man and that our current president is a Sudanese man called Jibril. Do you agree that your information might have been wrong and you are also willing to apologize to him for that error? Anybody can make a mistake. No, not at all. Buhari is dead and buried in a shallow grave in Saudi Arabia. Aisha Buhari was there. She came back from what they call the lesser heart. She was wearing black. She was mourning. If you look at the pictures that were circulated at that, at that point in time, you will see the smog, or should I say, the forlorn faces of northern governors. A minute silence was held at the AU for a late Buhari. Even Her Britannic Majesty Elizabeth II also penned a condolence message to the people of Nigeria before the cabal took over and asked her to rescind it, which she did. Buhari is dead, and I'm prepared to stake Biafra on it. If you, Dele Momodu, can go and prove to me, I'm not asking you to do anything too complex. If you can go and ask this man you call Buhari, whoever it is in Asorok, to come outside, don't do very much, address a panel of Nigerian youths, maybe 20 of them, and speak Buhari's mother tongue, which is Fufude. I will give up Biafra, I will apologize to him, and I will submit myself to any authority on this earth to do with me as they please. There is no Buhari. Jubril was there. Jubril followed Abakiri to Cuba and ran away from there and never came back. The man you have now in Asarok is from Niger Republic. His name is Yusuf Abubakar Muhammad. That's his name. Yusuf Abubakar Muhammad. Even Shekau knows who he is personally and was mentioning his name as well. It is not Buhari. The, the old Buhari that you and I know, the country cannot be burning and he will restrict himself to only 12 minutes of edited broadcast. Impossible. Impossible. Anybody that knows Buhari, even if he's dying, he must speak because he fought in his own understanding to keep Nigeria warm. Anything that impacts or threatens the territory, in, in the territorial um, um, cohesion and integrity of Nigeria, the old Buhari, in fact, will be in Lagos. The old Buhari will be in Lagos, I'm telling you. But this little, have you not seen him? with his fresh hands, hands of a 35 year old. He cannot wear this. He cannot wear this. Because if he wears this, his ear will bend because he's rubber. Silicon. We know about AI technology. It's deep fake. Please Google it. You're a media man, you must know this. I can replicate this very interview with your face showing us having this conversation. But it is not you. You also saw that some, would I say, some uh, some eagle-eyed um, 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 investigators managed to discover that there was actually a microphone, that a loudspeaker on the table. It's everything that they claimed that Buhari was saying was coming from a loudspeaker. From a loudspeaker. Very, very sad indeed. These are the things that the world must understand and come to terms with. That the person you are calling Buhari is not Buhari, and I can stake my life on it. If he comes out tomorrow and takes, or should I say, address any press interview live without Garobashe who bring this telling people to court, 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 court. If he can come out tomorrow, a panel of journalists will answer, no, no, not journalists because some of them are corrupt. Youths will address him. There and then you will know that Buhari is no more. There is no Buhari. No country. How can you have a country you claim you're proud of 
and that country is run by 10 minute video recorded every four four months what sort of country is that every four months you issue a, a pre-recorded um video to address 200 million people what an insult what an insult in a time of crisis there is COVID 19 people are agitating they're very restive all the only thing you can do is 10 minutes video laughable and absolutely absurd and no sensible person should be able to tolerate it who is dead and i stake my life on it please don't stake your life on it because i am very very convinced that he is alive i have been meeting worried since 2010 okay and the last time i met him was two years ago inside Aso Rock with a former president yes. of Africa. I met him, we interacted, he cracked jokes. We... All right, that's the message. Yes, I know you followed us to this particular end. I know you must have remembered.